Is it not possible for God and the Guru to effect the liberation of a soul? Bhagwan, God and the Guru will only show the way to liberation. They will not by themselves take the soul to the state of liberation. In truth, God and Guru are not different. Just as the prey which has fallen into the jaws of a tiger has no escape, so those who have come within the ambit of the Guru, gracious look, will be saved by the Guru and will not get lost. Yet, each one should will be saved by the Guru and each one should by his own effort pursue the path shown by the God or Guru and gain liberation. Again I repeat, each one should by his own effort pursue the path shown by God or Guru and gain liberation. One can know oneself only with one's own eyes of knowledge and not with somebody else's eyes. Thus, who he is Rama require the help of a mirror to know that he is Rama. So in the path of uh, pursuing this effort towards our own liberation and knowing the self, it is so apt that Michael is here today to talk to us about Nanyar. Namaskaram. Um, as we all know, uh, what Bhagavan taught is the purest Advaita Vedanta. But why was it necessary for Bhagavan to come and give his teachings? Already there's a, a mountain of literature on Advaita Vedanta. There are the three um, uh, sets of source texts, the Prasthanatreya, uh, that is the Upanishads, the Brahma Sutra, and the Bhagavad Gita. And there are commentaries on them written by Shankara and commentaries on Shankara's commentaries and other commentaries. And there are innumerable other texts. Since the time of Shankara, so many uh, texts have been written on Advaita Vedanta. So did Bhagavan just come to give a few more uh, texts like Uludunapta and Nana to add that huge mountain of already existing texts. No, Bhagavan obviously came for some for some uh, deeper purpose. To, uh, a clue to the purpose of, of, of why Bhagavan came and gave his teachings, a clue is given by Krishna himself in the first three verses of chapter four of the Bhagavad Gita. What he says in those three verses is, I taught this imperishable yoga to uh, uh, Vishvasvan, that's the sun god. Vishvasvan, Vivasvan taught it to Manu. Manu taught it to Ichvaku. Um, thus receiving this by uh, Parampara, that's an unbroken succession, the Raja Rishis, Rishis understood it. However, in the course of time, this great yoga was lost in this world, uh, subduer of enemies. He addresses Arjuna as subduer of enemies. The word for lost there is nashta, which means lost or spoiled or corrupted. So in the course of time, even the purest teachings do uh, become spoiled and corrupted. And then he, Krishna goes on in the third verse to say, that same ancient yoga, this ultimate secret, is taught by me to you today because you're my devotee and friend. So this is the nature of things, but when, when the truth is revealed in words, yeah, over time it does become uh, corrupted. Since the time of Shankara, what has happened is um, for various reasons, uh, among them being that there were so many uh, other schools of uh, thought, so many other interpretations of Vedanta came, uh, uh, um, uh, Ramanuja um, gave a different interpretation, instead of Advaita, he interpreted a vicious Advaita, Madhavacharya uh, 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 interpreted in terms of Dvaita, and also there were so many other schools of philosophy in India, and they all, um, because Shankara had established 
Advaita, as that is the correct interpretation. Many who couldn't argue with Shankara, after the time of Shankara, so many arguments were made against the Dvaita. So, so many uh, the, uh, followers of Shankara had to defend his philosophy in so many ways. And so more and more elaborate arguments were there. And because they're arguing with other schools of thought, they have to argue in terms of their school, or, you know, on their terms. That's one reason. Another reason is even Shankara didn't always express a Dvaita in the purest way. The reason is because he had a mission to establish uh, a Dvaita as the correct interpretation of Vedanta, he had to argue with so many other schools. So he had to present a Dvaita in a way that would be suitable to their level of grasping. Within a Dvaita, there are so many uh, different levels of explanation. Even within Bhagavan's teachings, we can see. Generally, Bhagavan always tried to... First, Bhagavan would try to push people to who am I? But when people were not ready to accept that, then Bhagavan would come down and give the same teaching in a more diluted form to suit their grasping power. So, the, 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 I mean, it is inevitable, but there will always be, and uh, fittingly, very different, um, different levels of explanation within Advaita. But anyway, over the course of time, what has been lost since the time of Shankara is what is the actual practice, how to actually put the Advaita teachings into practice. That is the philosophy of Advaita, all the arguments, why I am not this body, I'm not this mind, I'm not this, I'm not any of these uh, Panchakoshas, I am only pure awareness. These arguments, there are innumerable arguments, innumerable ways of arguing. So many prakriyas, as they call them. There's the Panchakosa prakriya and the um, Avasta Treya Prakriya, the, the, um, analyzing the three states, and so many other um, arguments are given to, uh, to convince us why we are not this body. But merely understanding that we are not this body, we are Brahman, doesn't solve our problems because uh, who is it who understands this? It's only us, the ego, who's understanding this. Ego is the problem, according to Bhagavan. So, Bhagavan came to uh, uh, clarify what is the practice. And he not only clarified what is the practice, part of the reason why the, uh, the practice is lost, that is, what is the essence of Advaita? The essence of Advaita, firstly, is ekameva advaitiam. There is only one without a second. So what is that one? Tattvamasi, you are that. So we are self of a one... Uh, an only reality. So when, they, when the Vedas say you are that, what do they expect us to do? Bhagavan has made this very clear in verse um, 32 of Uludunapadu. Um, what he says in verse 32 is, okay, I think many of you are Tamilian, so I'll read the, I'll read the Tamil as a uh, Padachetam. Aduni Endru Amarigal Atiravum that is when the Vedas proclaim that is you, Tane Edu Endru Tan Tendu Iradu, instead of oneself being, uh, knowing oneself as what? In other words, instead of investigating what am I and thereby knowing and being what we actually are, Idu uh, Nan, uh, uh, sorry, Adu Nan, Idu Andru, Endru, Ennal, uh, Uranin um, uh, now, thinking I am that, not this, is due to Uranin uh, now literally means non existence of strength, or we can take it as lack of strength. Uh, why? Endrum aduve tanai amavadal, because that alone is always, literally means always seated as oneself. That alone always exists as oneself. That is, we, when we are that, why should we be continuing to think I am that, that, not this, not this means not this body or mind or any of these panchakosas? Why should we be continuing to think that instead of investigating what am I and, uh, turn, uh, and, um, and thereby knowing and being what we actually are? Um, that is when the Vedas say you are that or I am that. What am I? Our attention should, the idea, the purpose of the 
um, of that of that Mahavakya is to turn our attention away from the idea of that of Brahman as something other than ourself, to turn our attention back to ourselves to find out what we ourselves are. So the implication is that we should turn back and investigate ourselves. But this implication has been lost among all the uh, uh, elaborate uh, uh, philosophy. That is, if you read the texts of um, Advaita Vedanta, many, particularly many of the later texts, they go into elaborate analysis of what is the Stula Sarira, what is the Sukshma Sarira, what are the 17 parts of the Sukshma Sarira, what is the Karana Sarira, and uh, analyzing all these, as Bhagavan said, this is like um, analyzing uh, and how they are composed of the Tanmatras and the, um, the different subtle elements and so many things. Bhagavan said all this analysis is like in a barber shop. If, uh, instead of sweeping up and throwing away the hair, but, uh, which is there just to be discarded, analyzing it, uh, how many gray hairs there are, how many short hairs, how many long hairs, how many black hairs, how many brown hairs, how many red hairs, how many curly hairs, how many straight hairs. All this analysis is unnecessary. Why? Because all that hair is just to be swept up and thrown away. So all this analysis of the non-self is unnecessary. What? When the Vedas say you are that, what we should investigate is, oh, then what am I? That is, um, so that, but that is the purpose why Bhagavan has come to make it clear what is the actual practice of, um, of self, uh, of that. They all talk about vichara. In all the texts, they talk about Atma vichara, but they take this analysis of all this, um, of the three states and the five sheaths and all these things as Atma vichara. According to Bhagavan, all this is necessary. We, we need to at least have a basic understanding of what we are not in order to, because otherwise if, we, if I take myself to be this body and I'm asked to investigate myself, I can just sit in a mirror looking at my face or I can um, take anatomy lessons or something. We, we need to understand what we're not. We're not this body, we're not this prana, the life, we're not this mind, we're not the intellect, we're not the will. That we need to understand. But understanding that is relatively simple. What we need to do then, if I'm none of these things, then I should ignore all these things and investigate myself. What am I? They, the basis, they, that is said, you are that. You are just that pure awareness, Brahman. So we should turn our attention back and investigate ourselves. Um, <clears throat> so today, what I'm going to be, uh, and the text I'm going to focus on mainly is, um, is Nana, because Nana, this is though this wasn't the first text to be published it was because it wasn't actually it, it was wasn't published until 1923 it was first published as a as in question and answer form as a i think it was in at that time it was 25 questions and answers were published as a appendix to a ramana charita haval which is a a biography that shiva kashan play wrote about bhagavan in verse form um so he, that was the first time it was published, and later it was published as a separate book as 30 questions and answers. Then Bhagavan wrote, rewrote those question and answers in the form of an essay. And when doing so, he in, in places he improved the wording and certain ideas Bhagavan um, omitted. Like at the beginning, Rama read one of the questions was, um, I can't remember which question that was, it was, um, that is whether uh, yes uh, if in the thirty in the thirty question answer version it was question nineteen. Kadavalam guruvalam orujivan shivamaka shivamaka mudiyama. Uh, is it possible for God or Guru to uh, to transform the jiva, transform a jiva into Shiva? And um, Bhagavan replied, Kadavalam Guruvam Muktiye Devataku Variye Karta Alamal Tamahave Jivagale Mukti Seka Mudiyadu. That literally means uh, God and Guru uh, will only show the way uh, to attain liberation, for attaining liberation. 
uh, of their, by themselves, they cannot, um, they cannot uh, 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 un, uh, 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 merge the jiva in mukti. They cannot make the jiva attain mukti. He said that for a reason. That is because our grace works through us. If we don't make the effort to turn our attention within, they cannot force us to do so. Bhagavan will never force us to surrender ourselves to him. We have to willingly surrender ourselves to him by turning our attention within. However, this sentence, if people take it out of context, and this could lead, this could be discouraging for some people. So Bhagavan omitted that sentence when he wrote it as an essay. So like that, Bhagavan, in many ways, he refined the text as an essay. I think the essay was probably first published around uh, 1926 or 27. Um, so the, the, the essay version is the principal version because Bhagavan wrote it himself. So that is the version I'm going to be focusing on now. When Bhagavan uh, wrote it as an essay, he added a paragraph at the beginning, which was not part of his uh, original answers to uh, to uh, Shiva Prakashan Pillai, but it is the very basis of his teaching. So this is a very important first paragraph. It is actually uh, a more condensed version of the beginning of his, his intro, the introduction that he wrote to his translation of uh, Vivaka Chudamani. But here he expresses it more um, in a more compact way. Uh, so first I'll talk about this paragraph. Um, what he says here is, Sakala jivagalam dukum embadindri epodum sukumai irika virumbadalam, virum, virumbu vadalam. Uh, that is, since all living, uh, since all sentient beings, all jivas, want or like to be happy, to be always happy without what is called misery. That's one reason. Second reason, yavakum tan iditileye parama priyam iripadalam. Uh, that is, since for everyone, the greatest love is only for oneself. That is more than, however much we may love others or other things or other people, or even God, we always love ourselves more than we love any other thing. We love other things. Why do we love God? Because we think God is going to protect us and take care of us and give us whatever we want. To, so we love God. Why do we love our, our family? Why do we love our friends? Why do we love anything in this world, even material objects, why do we love them? Because we think they will contribute to our happiness. So our great, the one thing we are all seeking is happiness. That is our very nature. Why, do, why are we all seeking happiness? The reason is very simple. According to Bhagavan, infinite happiness is our own real nature. But now we have risen as ego, we have, we have limited ourselves to the uh, to the, to, to within the limits of this body, with it, that is, we're limited in time, we're limited in space, and we're limited, um, we, we are one thing and not other things. So we have limited ourselves in so many ways. As this limited ego, we cannot know, we cannot experience the unlimited, infinite happiness that we actually are. So um, it, seeking happiness is our very nature. We cannot for a moment rest without seeking happiness. All the efforts of all jivas, from the tiniest ant or insect to the gods in heaven, whatever efforts we make, they are all driven by our desire for happiness. That desire for happiness is fundamental to our nature as ego. But why? Because happiness is our real nature, and it's because happiness is our real nature that we love ourselves. So, he, as I say, the first argument he gives is that uh, we all love to be happy always without misery. Happy without misery means unalloyed, infinite, unlimited happiness. Uh, and we all have greatest love for ourselves. And then in the third clause, he says, Priyataku sukume karan madalalam, since happiness alone is the cause of love. This is also a very important thing. Why do we love anything? Because that it is only for the sake of happiness that we love things. If, we, if something contributes to our happiness, we like it. If it detracts from our happiness, we dislike it. 
That's the, so all our likes, dislikes, desires, fears, everything arises out of our basic desire for happiness. And our basic desire for happiness is because happiness is our real nature, we can, and because we love ourselves, we cannot but uh, desire happiness. That is our very nature. So it is not wrong. The problem is we've been seeking happiness in the wrong places. We've been seeking happiness in things other than ourselves. We think uh, uh, we depend on other things for our happiness. Whereas according to Bhagavan, happiness is our real nature. So he's given three arguments there. Those three arguments already uh, uh, point to the fact that happiness is our real nature. Why? Because we have greatest love for ourselves, and happiness alone is the cause for love. So what are we? We ourselves must be happiness. That's why we love ourselves so much. But then he goes on to give another argument, but not as a sense clause. He then, in, in a different, he then, uh, in, he's now coming to the, towards the main clause. He gives uh, um, uh, he, what he says in the rest of the um, sentences. Manamatra uh, nidrail dinum anubhavikam tan subhavamana achukate adeya tane tan aridal vendum. Achukate adeya to attain means to attain that happiness. Now we're, this, this is coming down to a practical. We all want to attain this happiness. That we're all seeking happiness. So how do we attain it? Well, one says to attain it. Uh, First, we need to understand what that happiness is. Uh, he says, Tan mana chukate, that happiness, which is one's own nature, one's own real nature, one's own subhava. And uh, then he gives an uh, another reason why it is uh, subhava. He, he, uh, there's a relative clause here. Manamatra nidrail dinamanu bhavikam tan subhava mana chukate. That is that happiness, which is our own real nature, we experience uh, daily, every day we experience this in uh, nidre. In nidre means in uh, sleep, meaning dream, dreamless sleep. Manamatra, which is devoid of mind, that is in sleep, there's no mind. And in the absence of mind, there's nothing else. So in sleep, what exists in sleep? We alone exist in sleep. And we, and what are we aware of in sleep? We're aware of ourselves alone, nothing else. So in that state, in which we exist and are alone and are aware of ourselves alone, we are perfectly happy. Why is that? Because happiness is our real nature. We ourselves are the happiness we are seeking. So in order to attain that happiness, what must be, what is necessary? Tane tan aridol vendum. Oneself, knowing oneself is necessary. So this is the this is the conclusion of this uh, first sentence. So this sentence, Bhagavan packs in uh, the essence of all his teachings. We, what we need to, why do we need to know ourselves? Because happiness alone is our real nature. So long as we take ourselves to be anything other than what we actually are, so long as we rise as ego and take ourselves to be, I am this person, I am Michael or I am whoever, we cannot experience the infinite happiness that is our own real nature. And so we will always be dissatisfied. We will seek happiness here and there. We'll seek happiness in wealth, in uh, sensual pleasures, in um, name and fame and power and um, or intellectual pursuits or sports or so many efforts we make in so many directions, whatever efforts we're making, whether they're whether our actions are good actions or bad actions, even the si worst sinners, what are they seeking? Even the murderers and the tyrants and the worst people, what are they seeking? They're only seeking happiness. They just happen to be seeking it in the wrong way. So we're all seeking happiness. But in order to attain that happiness, it's necessary for us to know ourselves. So how do we know ourselves? That he, that he answers in the second and last uh, sentence of this uh, paragraph. Adaku nana enum jnana vicharame mukhya sadhanam. Adaku means for that. Nana enum jnana vicharame means the jnana vichara, who am I? What does jnana vichara mean? Jnana in this context means awareness. Awareness is our own real nature. As he said in verse 13 of Uludunapadu, jnana mam tane me. 
oneself who is awareness, who is jnana, alone is real. So jnana here means the awareness that we actually are, the pure awareness I am. So uh, uh, investigating that fundamental awareness I am, and that investigation of uh, fundamental awareness I am is what is called nana, who am I? So uh, uh, the jnana vichara called who am I, uh, uh, vichara may, he puts an emphasis on the vichara, meaning vichara alone, mukhya sadhanam, the principal means. What does he mean here by the principal means? Does he mean that there are so many means, and this is just one among them, but the best among them or something like that? No, it means more than that. As Bhagavan has made clear in so many places, the only means by which we can know ourselves is by self-investigation. Why? If you want to see the sun, what do you have to do? You have to turn and look at it. If you don't turn and look at it, whatever other me whatever means you may you may try to adopt, you cannot see the sun until you turn and look at it. Likewise, in order to know what we actually are, we need to turn back within and see what we actually are. Tirumbia handane dinamahakankan terium and drenaya naranachra. Bhagavan sings in Aksharam like that. Is, this is what Aranachra taught Bhagavan. Aranachra obviously didn't teach in words, Aranachra teaches only in silence, but Bhagavan has conveyed to us in words what Aranachra taught him in silence. Tirumbia ham, turning within, dinam ahakankan. Uh, uh, see yourself uh, daily, that means constantly. Ahakan, uh, ahakan uh, uh, means inner eye, it's implied by the inner eye, that by the eye of attention, we need to see ourselves uh, daily or constantly. Dinmahakan, terium and terium means it will be known. So if we want to know what we actually are, we need to turn back within to see what we actually are. There is no other way. So why does he say here that it's the mukhya sadhanam, the principal means? Um, um, Bhagavan sometimes used to say, all other paths are useful for purifying the mind. They are like, and by purifying the mind, as he says, for example, in, um, in verse three of Upadesh Undia, he says, um, um, uh, 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 kartanu kakum nikamiya karmam karte tirti akdundi para gati vari kambi komundi para. That means nishkarmiya um, karma. That means action done without desire. Kartanu uh, kakum done for God. Doing that, doing nishkarmiya karma. Uh, for God, in other words, doing action without um, without uh, seeking any uh, fruit from that action, but just for the love of God. That's what it implies. Karate uh, tiriti, uh, it will reform the mind. That means it will purify the mind. In Sanskrit, he says chitta sodakam. It will purify the mind. Chittam actually means will. The very, in a very, when it's used in a technical sense, chitta means will. So purifying the will means pure, the impurities in our will are all our vishaya vasanas, all our inclinations to go outward. So chitta sodakum or uh, uh, karate tirti means uh, uh, rem uh, removing those impurities in the mind, those impurities of our vasanas. We cannot remove them entirely so long as ego remains, but we can weaken them to a considerable extent. So by uh, bhakti and other paths, we, it is possible to purify the mind to a great extent. But what is the root of all impurity? The root impurity is only ego. So without getting rid of ego, we cannot achieve a complete purification of mind. That complete purification of mind is what is called vasanakshaya, the complete eradication of all vasanas. We cannot eradicate vasanas without rooting out ego. That's why Bhagavan's teaching, whether it is akshram lai or, I mean, whether Aranach just did pancham or Uludun um, or Nana or Upadesh Undiya or any of Bhagavan texts, there's always one aim and one aim alone. Arunachala mena ahamein ini pava ahate be rarupai arunachala. Arunachala, you root out, you eradicate 
the ego of those who, it can be taken in two ways for beginning bed, it can be taken those who, uh, who, of, who think, uh, who think Arunachala, but I alone is Arunachala, that is, Arunachala is only that which is shining in my heart as I, or we can take it who those who think of our natural in my heart. It amounts to the same, whichever way we take it. So the very purpose of the manifestation of our natural, the very purpose of the manifestation of our natural as Bhagavan Ramana is the annihilation of ego, the eradication of ego. So that's what Bhagavan's teachings are all about. That's what our natural duty punch for me is all about. That is what the Uludunapdu, Nana, Upadeshundi, all Bhagavan teachings are only about that. How to eradicate ego. To do so, Nan, very investigation, who am I is a principal mean. Other paths like bhakti, yoga, and so on, they are like tributaries. So, supposing the only river that flows into the um, into the ocean is the Ganga. That is just suppose. All other rivers, if they want to flow into, if you, the water in the other rivers is to flow into the ocean, they first have to flow into Ganga, and then uh, along with the Ganga water, where we swept away to the ocean. So Ganga is the principal uh, river. Other rivers are all tributaries. Likewise. Uh, that it's in that sense that Bhagavan says here, but Atma Vichara is the principal means. Ultimately, it's the only means. But uh, other parts are also beneficial in order to bring us to this part. That's why in verse 3 of Upadesh India, but I was just reading, he says, the Nishkarmiya karma done with love for God will purify the mind and gati vari calm become. It will show the way to liberation. What's he mean by show the way to liberation? It will give us the clarity to understand that we cannot attain liberation without eradicating ego, and we cannot eradicate ego with, without turning within to investigate ourselves. Why is that? Because ego is nothing but a false awareness of ourself. What we actually are is only the pure awareness I am. But as ego, we're not just aware of ourself as I am. We're aware of ourself as I am so and so. I am this body. So that, that awareness of ourself as something other than what we actually are, that is, uh, that is ego. And that is what is called Ajnana or Avidya. There's no Ajnana or Avidya other than our false awareness. I am this body. I am this person. I am Michael. That is Avidya. In order to get rid of that, since it's a, a wrong awareness of ourself, only the correct awareness of ourself will get rid of it. In other words, we need to be aware of ourselves as we actually are. And to be aware of ourselves as we actually are, we need to investigate ourselves. That is why in Upadesh India, in verse 8, after describing all the different types of nishkarmiya karma, the, the puja, the japa, and dhyana, and how each one is progressively more effective in purifying the mind, what is the most effective means of purifying the mind? He, I mean, it, by implication, from a context, we have done that. What he does when he says in um, in uh, verse uh, uh, four that um, after after saying in verse three that uh, nishkarmiya karma, done for the love of God, will purify the mind and show the way to liberation. In verse four, he says. Um, Actions of mind, speech, and body, the puja, japa, and dhyana are actions of mind, speech, and body. And each one, and each that is in this order, they, each one is superior to the previous one. What does he mean by superior? It's more effective in purifying the mind. Then he goes on describing each one in verses five, six, and seven, how each one is more, I mean, he's, he, 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 he says each one is more effective than the previous one. But then what does he say in verse eight? Anya bhavatin abhanaha mahum ananya bhava me undi para anaitinam utamo mundi para. That is, rather than anya bhava, rather than meditating on God or having devotion to God as something other than oneself, ananya bhava, that is, meditating on what is not other, that is, uh, with the conviction that he is I, that is the anaitim utam, that is the best of all. That means, of all the means to purify the mind, the most effective is to meditate on what is not other than oneself, with the conviction that he is I. What is not other than oneself? 
only oneself. So medit what he calls there Ananya Bhava is nothing but another way of describing the same practice, but he describes here as Jnana Vichara, the practice of self-investigation. It's only, only when we turn our attention back towards ourselves that is the most effective way of purifying the mind. Because what are the impurities of the mind? Vishaya Vasanas, that is the inclination we have to go away from ourselves towards other things. That is, those are their impurities. So other means, for example, if we are meditating on God, suppose we take God to be something other than ourselves, and we have great love for God. When we meditate on God, we're trying to fix our name, our mind, on the name or form of God. And when we are fixing our, our mind with love on his name and form, we are thereby uh, other vasanas to think, inclinations to think about this or that will rise. But because of our love for him, we cling to his name and form, and thereby we don't follow the, the vasanas that prompt us to think about other things. So in that way, we're reducing the the strength of our Vishaya Vasanas. But the, uh, the name and form of God is still something other than ourselves. It's still a Vishaya of, of sorts. We maybe uh, we, we maybe have that love for it as God, but it's actually something other than ourselves. What God actually is, is that which is shining in our heart as I. So the most effective means to purify the mind is Ananya Bhava, meditating on nothing other than oneself. That is what Bhagavan means in verse 8 of Upadesh India. So the whole purpose of those first uh, uh, eight verses, uh, eight and nine, ten, also their continuation of the same idea, is to emphasize that the most effective means to purify the mind and the only means to eventually eradicate ego is uh, turning our attention back towards ourselves, being self-attentive, practicing the Atma Vichara. So that is the meaning of uh, this uh, paragraph, this introductory paragraph. So there's so much meaning Bhagavan has packed into this short paragraph of two sentences. This is the very foundation of his teachings. Then, then the rest of the text is, um, uh, consists mostly of the answers that Bhagavan gave to Shiv Prakash and Palai. However, there's a, a one thing about the second paragraph that is generally, that is, it is known by some people, but many people don't know it, is the first question that Shiva Prakash and Palai asked was Nana, who am I? The fact that he asked this question Nana shows what a, what a apt disciple, what a fitting disciple he was for Bhagavan. Bhagavan has come to this world only to teach this path of self-investigation, who am I? And Shiva Prakash and Palai, not knowing anything about Bhagavan, except having understanding that he's a, though he's a young boy, he's a great saint. He, the first question he asked him was, Nana, who am I? What did Bhagavan reply? All the Bhagavan, in those days, Bhagavan was talking very little. So most of his answers, he either wrote, uh, probably this answer, Bhagavan would just have written on the uh, sandy ground because he used to do that sometimes, because the ground, in, in dry weather, the ground becomes a bit sandy, but one would write in the sand. So probably this first answer he would have written in the sand. Later on, Shiv Prakash and Palai started to bring either a slate and chalk or a piece of paper and a pencil for Bhagavan to write. And maybe some answers Bhagavan gave verbally, we don't know exactly, but um, most of them Bhagavan gave in writing. So when Shiv Prakash and Palai asked him, Nana, Bhagavan simply replied, Arive Nan, awareness alone is I. And then the second question she Kevin Play asked, I'll just get the, the original question answer. The second, the second um, question he asked was Arivin Sarupam Enna. Uh, what is the nature of uh, of Arivu? Arivu means awareness. Um, but the, the awareness Bhagavan is pointing to here. What is the nature of that awareness? Bhagavan, uh, the, the answer is Arivin Sarupam Satchidanandam. Probably Bhagavan would just have answered uh, Satchidananda, uh, because as I say, he was saying very little. But anyway, in the but when, as I said, this, this for many years nobody knew about this uh, these question and answers that the Shiv Prakash had asked these questions and recorded these answers. Um, but in 1923. 
when he was going to publish this biography of Bhagavan, Charit, Ramana Charita Harbal, and he wanted to put some of those questions and answers in the appendix because he referred to those teachings that Bhagavan gave him in Ramana Charita Harbal. He wanted to include these. So his nephew, Manikam Palai, brought the manuscript to Bhagavan and showed to Bhagavan. And when Bhagavan looked through and he saw the, uh, an his answer to the first question, there was so much else was written there. So Bhagavan said, oh, I didn't say any of this. And then Bhagavan himself said, oh, because Shiva Kashan Palai had studied philosophy in university, he would have learned all these things when he was in university. And so in order to help him to understand the answer I gave, Arive Nan, he would have added this for his own clarification. This may be useful for others to so let it remain. That is why the rest of the, the second paragraph is there. What, what Bhagavan says in the rest of the second paragraph, we need not go through it in detail, but basically it's the stool a day, the, stool, the gross body is not I, the five uh, sense organs are not I, the five, um, uh, the five uh, organs of action are not I, the five pranas or panchavayus, the five winds are not I, um, uh, the mind which thinks is not I, and the, what remain when all phenomena and actions cease in sleep, um, the ignorance or the absence of all awareness of other things that is combined only with vishaya vasanas uh, is also not I. Eliminating the, uh, everything mentioned above as not I, not I, the awareness that uh, that stands alone, that, that stands isolated, alone is I. So all of that was added by Shiv Prakash and Palai. So that is not actually what by, by the original questions and answers of uh, the, the part of the original answer given by Bhagavan, but it is it is necessary. That is, in order to, to investigate what we actually are, we first need to understand what we are not, and that we are the awareness that is but but is isolated from all these that remain in sleep. What remains, though it is said here that ignorance remains, Bhagavan clarified sleep is not a state of, Bhagavan clarified elsewhere, sleep is not actually a state of ignorance. In sleep, we are not aware of anything other than ourselves, but we are perfectly aware of ourselves. That is that Bhagavan in Mahasha's Gospel, it's called the Bhagavan said, sleep is not ignorance, it is one's pure state. It is a state of pure awareness. Uh, and he says, sleep is, uh, waking is a state of full ignorance, because in waking we know all these other things, none of which are real. What is real is only I am. So uh, anyway, that's how this, uh, this second paragraph, most of the sentences of the second paragraph, it is not actually what Bhagavan said, but what Shibkash and Palai learned in, in university. This is the, the, the usual analysis that is there in, in the, these are the basics of Advaita philosophy, as taught in the older texts. Um, I, I may be running out of time a bit, so I'm going to skip the next few paragraphs. The next few paragraphs are very important. That is in verses, in paragraphs three and four, Bhagavan emphasizes we cannot know ourselves so long as we are aware of, uh, so long as they're jagged drishti, perception of the world. So long as we perceive the world, we cannot know ourselves. He said this for a very practical reason, because as he, uh, as he explained in, um, in verse 4 of Uludhanaptu, what he says in verse 4 of Uludhanaptu is, Uruvam tanayin uluhu paramatran. If one's self is a form, the world and God will be likewise. If one's self is not a form, who can see their forms and how? So we are aware of the world of names and forms only when we mistake ourself to be a name and form. In other words, only when we rise as ego and take a body as I, are we aware of all these other forms? So, so long as we are, there's Jagat Drishti, so long as we perceive this world of names and forms, we are mistaking ourselves to be a body. And so long as we mistake ourselves to be a body, we can't see ourselves as we actually are. When we see ourselves as we actually are, this ego will be eradicated. There'll be no more, we will no longer be aware of ourselves as I am this body, we'll be aware of ourselves just as I am I. Nan, nan. And when we're aware of ourselves as I am I, we won't be aware of anything other than ourselves. So the, 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 
Jaga Drishti is the very nature of ego. So long as we are aware of anything other than ourselves, we who are aware of that are ego. That's why Bhagavan emphasizes that so long as there's Jagat Drishti, perception of the world, we cannot know ourselves as we actually are. It's, uh, so these, these are, and then in the, the fifth paragraph, he talks about mind. What actually is the mind of all the thoughts that arise in the mind? The thought called I alone is the first thought. What he refers to here as the thought called I is ego. So of all the thoughts that appear in the mind, the thought called I alone is the first thought. This is something that Bhagavan repeatedly emphasizes. Why? Because all other thoughts are objects. They're things known by us. The thought called I, the ego, is the subject, but that which is aware of all other thoughts. So without ego, there can't be any other thoughts. Without the thought called I, no other thoughts can arise. So he says, only after this rises do other thoughts rise. And then he says the same thing in other words, only after the first person, first person here means ego or that primal thought called I, only after the first person appears do second and third persons appear. Second and third persons means all other things. Without the first person, second and third persons do not exist. So uh, it, it, that is everything depends upon its for its seeming existence upon our seeming existence as ego as ego we're aware of ourselves as i am this i am this body so ego is the root problem this is what bhagavan has this is that what one, i was saying earlier about why why bhagavan has come to what bhagavan has revealed what was what was it that was lost that what was it that was uh uh um, but um, but um, but over time have become spoiled or corrupted. That is, what is the actual practice of vichara was lost. There's a reason for this. That is, in old days, it was generally it wasn't the actual what vichara actually means was explained by the guru to the, directly to the disciple. It wasn't the. the they didn't elaborate upon it in, in the text, because in those days, the tradition was that you learn all the, all the text, but then you go to the guru who will, who will reveal the inner meaning of the text. So it was, it was by word of mouth that the practice of Atma Vichara was taught, not in the text. And now Bhagavan has openly revealed it, but Anyway, that over the course of time, that got lost among all the philosophizing. But Bhagavan, not only has he come to, uh, not only has Bhagavan taught us what is the actual practice, but he's also greatly simplified the ancient philosophy. As I said, it's become unnecessarily complicated, analyzing all the, uh, 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 the 17 parts of the Sukshma Sarira and all these things and how all these things come into existence. It's all unnecessarily complicated. Bhagavan has simplified everything. In Ulidanaptu, he says in verse 26, Ahande undayin, anetum undahum. Ahande indrail, indru anetum. Ahande yavamam. That is, if ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. If ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist. The same that he's saying here, only after the first person appears do second and third persons appear. Without the first person, second and third persons do not exist. That is nothing else exists. Second and third persons here isn't talking about people, it's talking about things other than ourselves. What he means by second and third persons in Tamil is not even called person. In Tamil they're called places. Um, uh, so munile padake girl means things other than ourselves. Kanme is ourself, uh, the subject. Munile padake, uh, second and third persons are all objects. So all objects depend for their semi existence upon the semi existence of ourself as the subject or the ego. So when if ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. If ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist. Ahande yavamam. Ego itself is everything. That is, ego is the seed that has sprouted as all this. Therefore, as he says, uh, Adalal, this verse, 20, this verse 26, we didn't have to, he concludes it by saying, Adalal yadu idu endru nadale over the yavamenor. Therefore, investigating what this is, is giving up everything. 
unless we are willing to give up everything, unless we are really willing to surrender ourselves completely, we cannot, uh, uh, we cannot merge back into our source and remain as we actually are, which is the pure awareness I am. So all these are very important. Um, I, I think I've talked a lot. I mean, there's a lot more I would like to say, but I don't know how we're managing, how we're doing for time. Um, Rama, should I draw to a close now or should I continue talking? I mean, I can continue talking indefinitely. There's so much, uh, in, in Nanya, so much is packed here, but um, I think our yeah, time is I... limited. Yeah, I know. Uh, Mike, can, maybe we can start taking questions now. Maybe that okay. is also... Okay, right, right. You know, we can, you know, get a we lot can, of things uh, yeah. clarified. And if, maybe in a later meeting, we can go through other paragraphs. Because I'm, we're now just coming to the paragraphs where Bhagavan's actually talking about practice, but we can leave that till later. Okay. So whoever has uh, sent some questions in the first, maybe we take those questions. Yes. And then uh, we can go to the other questions one okay, by one. Okay, certainly. Yeah, I believe Nancy, you had a question you want to ask. Hi, Rama. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, it's sort of long because it was a written question. And so I apologize. Uh, it was, it's sort of a yes, no, but it's sort of a long. Okay. Um, in paragraph 19 of Nanyar, the end of paragraph 19 states, to the extent possible, it is not appropriate to intrude in others' affairs. All that one gives to others, one is giving to oneself. If one knew this truth, who indeed would remain without giving? The statement, all that one gives to others, one is giving to oneself, appears to be from the standpoint of the absolute, where there is no difference between giving to what our senses perceive as other body-mind complexes and to what our senses perceive as this body-mind complex. Yet the previous statement, to the extent possible, it is not appropriate to intrude in others' affairs, seems to reference the state when the mind is turned outward, away from the Atman, and our senses are perceiving others based on identification with this body-mind complex. The concluding statement, if one knew this truth, who indeed would remain without giving, seems to indicate that with the shift of the I from the body-mind complex to the Atman, we naturally feel the oneness of all. Abiding as I, I, right action is performed naturally for all living beings. This distinction between this and other body-mind complexes having vanished like the snake in a rope. So my question was, is this a correct understanding of the teaching? Um, I, no, I don't think Bhagavan here is talking about the state of attainment, because in the state of attainment, there are no others. There, right. That, <laughs> so this, this is, even when, even when we are following the path, that is to the extent that we are truly following Bhagavan's path of self-investigation and self-surrender, our ego will be subsiding. The more ego subsides, though we still take ourselves to be this body and we take others to be others, that, that distinction between oneself and others uh, dissolves to a certain extent. That is, so supposing a person is, has a very impure mind, they've got very strong desires, and the, the, uh, because of the impurities in their mind and the strength of their desires, they'll be very selfish. They'll care only about themselves. They won't care about others. Doesn't matter about others. So long as I'm okay, that's all that matters. As we follow the spiritual path, any spiritual path, our mind is gradually getting purified. And particularly when we're following this ultimate path of self-investigation and self-surrender, the mind is getting, uh, this is the most effective means to purify the mind. As the mind is purified, our uh, vasanas, which are the seeds which give rise to likes, dislikes, desires, and attachment, they're growing weaker. So we become less selfish. Naturally, our mind is purified. And as we become less selfish, we, for example, if we see a person suffering, 
it's painful for us. Why is it painful? Because we see us, we, we feel ourselves in their position. We still feel that person to be other than us, but we, fe we feel how it would be to be in that situation. So it pains us to feel, uh, see others suffering. So in that state, even in the, in the we're still in the state of uh, ego, we're still practicing, but we, the, 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 because of the purification of mind, the, the, sense, the, the distinction between oneself and others is it's still there, but it's not so strong, we can say. I mean, it's difficult to put it in words. So we naturally feel empathy, compassion, and we care for others. So if we see another person, if we've got food and another person is hungry, we naturally will give our food to that person because they have more need for it than us. In that sense, Bhagavan says, uh, if whatever is given to others is given only to oneself. And it is given to oneself because if, if we give wholeheartedly anything, we, who is the one who is benefited? We have the satisfaction of giving. We, we saw a person who was hungry. When that person eats food, how much joy it will give us. So we, we definitely, the more we give, the more we are benefited. We, we derive by giving to others, we are deriving immediate benefit because we have the satisfaction of, uh, of alleviating their difficulty, their suffering. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and, and what he says about not interfering in the affairs of others, because why Bhagavan said that in the previous sentence, he says, as far as possible, we should not allow our mind to dwell on worldly matters. The reason is, according to Bhagavan, this is all a dream. If the best help we can do, we, if we look at the world, there's so much suffering in so many forms, disease and uh, poverty and so many things. We can't alleviate all the suffering in this world. By any amount of good work we do, we can't alleviate suffering. But in a dream, if you see suffering, if you see a, in your dream, if you see a war, or if you see a famine, or if you see a terrible pandemic or something going on, you see people, so many people suffering, how, what is the best thing you can do to alleviate all that suffering? wake up from a dream as soon as you wake up from a dream all the suffering you saw in that dream comes to an end likewise the best help we can do for all for the whole world is to wake up from this dream so rather than allowing our mind to go out and uh, to worry about all these things turning within and investigating we what we are so far that is the greatest help we can do for the world that is why for people who, who, who weren't ready to come to his path, but were very eager to help the world, Bhagavan said, he who has created this world knows how to take care of it. Leave it to him. In other words, leave it to God. That, of course, Bhagavan is coming down one level because his pure teaching is the world comes into existence only when you rise as ego. So the creator of the world is actually our rising as ego. But for people who are, who, whose minds are more extroverted, they will not be ready to accept that. So for them, he says, there's a higher power who's created this world, who's taking care of this world. Leave it to him. Don't worry yourself about it. You surrender yourself to him. That's the greatest good you can do. Thank you. <laughs> right. Thank you. Yeah, the next question is from Jay Matthews. The... Oh, I sure am. Hi, Michael. Hi, Roman. Hi. Go ahead. So my question, Michael, is why are we so drawn to Bhagavan? What does Bhagavan say in the first, in the second clause of that first paragraph of Nana? We all have greatest love for ourself because Bhagavan is ourself. Bhagavan is our own real nature. Bhagavan is, is the I am within us has appeared outside in the form of Bhagavan in order to turn us, our attention back within. That is the outer form of Bhagavan. What does he say? The guru is not outside, the guru is inside. So what he actually is, is that which is shining in our heart as I. Though he, but 
So when we see his outward form and we see the, the love and the kindness in his eyes, <laughs> we're able to recognize in him, our, uh, though we don't fully understand it, we, there's some sort of intuitive uh, recognition of our own real nature shining in that form. So we are all naturally drawn to Bhagavan because Bhagavan is ourself. He is what we actually are. That is why we need to surrender ourselves wholly to him. But when we surrender ourselves wholly to him, he alone will remain. And what is he? He is I am. Thank you so much. <laughs> but the secret of Bhagavan's Bhagavan, Bhagavan said, here it's all an open secret. So even the secret of his power of attraction, he has openly revealed to us. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> the third question was from Bhaskar. <laughs> Hi, namaste everyone. Hi, Michael. Hi. Um, I had many questions, but you have answered many of them in your um, uh, talk. Um, I got a couple of questions. But I will have one question now. And if there is time, I will come back for the second question. Right. My question is, during your talk, you told that um, self-intention um, is not possible because of lack of weakness. Uran in my all. Not self-intention. So how to increase that strength? Right. Okay. What Bhagavan said there, instead of investigating ourselves, if we just go on thinking, I am not, I, I am that, not this, that is due to lack of strength. Um, strength is needed to turn within. The strength that is required is the strength of bhakti and vairagya. That is in, uh, in the 11th paragraph of Nana, in the 10th and 11th paragraph, I was hoping to cover those today, but I couldn't. Um, they are very important paragraphs because why this, Bhagavan has said in uh, Anma Vide, this is, uh, this is the, so easy is this Atma Vidya. And he says there, I think in the third verse, um, of, all the, uh, of all the paths, this path is the, um, oh, oh, oh yeah, fourth, fourth verse, he says, to remove the bonds of karma and to bring an end to birth, uh, of all paths, this path is the easiest. So, According to Bhagavan, this is the easiest of all paths. But when we try to follow this path, we feel uh, we feel difficulty. We feel it's uh, it's not Bhagavan. It's okay. It's easy for Bhagavan, but it's difficult for us. We say it's, <laughs> when Bhagavan says it's easy, he means it's easy for everyone. It's easy for us. Why does it seem difficult for us? Because of the strength of our Vishaya Vasanas. So the strength of our Vishaya Vasanas is our weakness. Because mm. our Vishaya Vasanas are strong, we are weak to go within. So that is where the lack of strength lies. So how to gain that, that strength? Only by that the most effective means, a nati as he says in verse 8 of Upadesh India, is only this practice of self-investigation. That is, the more we try to turn within, the more we are thereby weakening the Vishaya Vasanas. Because... If you think about it, at every moment, uh, we have a choice. That is, the Vishayavasanas are constantly trying to uh, rise as thoughts. The Vishayavasanas are the seeds. Those mm. seeds cannot survive without sprouting as thoughts. They need to sprout as thoughts and get our attention. That's how they live. Later on in the, uh, in that, uh, in the 11th paragraph, Bhagavan gives the analogy. So long as there are enemies in the fortress, Supposing there's an enemy fortress, you've, you, you've uh, besieged it. So the enemy are there in the fortress. So long as they remain in the fortress, they've got no food and water. If they've mm -hmm. got plenty of food and water, they won't come out. But they, they haven't got any food and water. So they need to come out to get food and water. So Bhagavan says, so long as there are enemies in the fortress, they'll continue coming out. If we continue cutting down as and when they come, uh, uh, come out, the fortress will eventually fall into our hands. We'll take possession of the fortress. The fortress there is our own heart. 
the enemies in our heart are the Vishaya Vasanas. Our own Vishaya Vasanas means our inclination towards Vishayas. Vishayas is phenomenal. So our inclination to experience anything other than ourselves is a Vishaya Vasana. These Vishaya Vasanas derive their strength only from us. That is, it's we who have that inclination. And if we don't give them attention when they sprout as thoughts, they, those thoughts will be destroyed and the Vishaya Vasana will become weaker and weaker. That's how we cut them down as and when they come out. So as soon as the Vishaya Vasana sprouts in the form of a thought, we, which is happening constantly throughout the, I mean, throughout the day, it's happening. According to Bhagavan, the whole world is nothing but our own thoughts. So, so long as we're aware of anything other than ourselves, those are Vishaya Vasana sprouted as thoughts. So, so long as, so at every moment we have a choice. Do we go after, do we follow the thoughts? So long as we allow our attention to go out towards other things, we are nourishing those thoughts and thereby nourishing the seeds from which they sprout. So we have a choice. Either we go after the thoughts or we turn our attention back towards ourselves. If we turn our attention back towards ourselves, we are thereby depriving that thought of the attention that it requires. No thought can arise if we don't attend to it. So we, by, 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 by constantly turning our attention back to ourselves and trying to hold on to that Swarupa dhyana, as he calls it, that uh, contemplation or meditation on our own real nature, that self-attentiveness, by the more we cling to that, the more the Vishaya Vasanas will be weakened. The more they're weakened, the greater will be our love to turn within, the bhakti. The weakening of the Vishaya Vasanas is called Vairagya. The, the strengthening of our love to turn within is called bhakti. Bhakti and vairagya are the two sides of the same piece of paper. You can't separate bhakti from vairagya. We have vairagya only to the extent that we have bhakti. And we have bhakti only to the extent we have vairagya. That Bhagavan compare in that 11th paragraph, Bhagavan compares vairagya and by implication bhakti also to a stone uh, but uh, a pearl diver tied to their uh, waist in order to sink in deep into the ocean. The pearl diver cannot sink deep enough into the ocean to get the pearls unless they've got a stone tied to their waist. Likewise, unless we've got the stone of bhakti and vairagya tied to our waist, we cannot sink deep enough within. So how do we cultivate that bhakti and vairagya? By the same practice of self-investigation and self-surrender. That's what Bhagavan says in the sixth paragraph. He says, what's it matter however many thoughts arise? Um, it's, this is a very important paragraph. Um, he says, um, however many thoughts arise, enna, what? So what? Big deal. What's it matter? Jagratei obvolo enumum kalambum pode. Idu yaraku and daitru endru vicharital enakendru tondrum. As soon as each thought arises, if one vigilantly investigates to whom it has risen, to me will be clear. In other words, our attention will be drawn back to ourself. And when our attention is drawn back to ourself, we don't, we shouldn't allow it to slip out again. We should hold on to ourselves. So holding on to ourselves is what he refers to in the next sentence. Nana enum vicharit, nana endru vicharita. If if one if one thus investigates that that is we 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 our attention has been drawn back to ourselves. If we then hold on to that self-attentiveness. That's what he means by nana endru vicharita. If one investigates who am I? Manum tan piripiditiku tirumbividum. The mind will return to its birthplace. Its birthplace means the source, the place from which it rose. What is the place from which it rose? Only from ourselves, only from the our fundamental awareness, I am. That fundamental awareness, I am, is the source from which we rise as ego. So by, by holding on to that self attentiveness, the mind thereby sinks back into its source. It returns to its source. Erinde enumum adangi The thought that had risen will subside. 
Why will it subside? Because it cannot survive without our attention. If we don't attend to it, we deprive it of our attention by attending only to ourselves, it will naturally subside. And then he says, Ipidi paraka paraka manataku tan pirapiditil tangi nikkam shakti adhikari kindridu. By practicing and practicing in this manner, the, uh, the strength. Uh, uh, the strength to abide in its own uh, birthplace will in the strength of the mind to abide in its own birthplace will increase. So how your question was how to gain strength? Bhagavan has given a direct answer here by practicing and practicing and practicing this Atma Vichara. Whenever our attention is diverted towards any thought, to whom does this thought appear to me? We turn it back to ourselves. We don't have to be questioning. Some people take this to be a process of questioning. Bhagavan never actually said question. What he says here, the verb he uses here is vichari. Vichari means investigate. So we need to investigate to whom it appears to me. Who am I? That, that is not, we're not repeating the word. We're turning our attention back towards ourself and then we're holding on to that self-attentiveness. By practicing and practicing in this way, we will get this, we will gain the strength to uh, abide firmly in our source, in, the, in our birthplace, and that is in the, uh, to abide just as I am, without rising as I am so and so. Beautiful, Michael. Thank you. Well, all thanks to Bhagavan, because I have no answer of my own. I am bereft of answers. All I know is what Bhagavan taught us, because he said it so clearly here. In Nana, Ulurunap, to Arunachitutu Panchakam, whatever questions we may have, he has answered them all. But we need to, to, in order to understand, in order to recognize the answers he's given, we need to practice, practice, practice what he has taught us. Then we get the clarity and it all becomes very clear how he's given all the answers to all possible questions. If he hasn't given the answer, then the question is unnecessary. Any, any relevant question, any useful question that we may ask, he has answered them all. Namaste in a very clear and simple manner. But the problem is Bhagavan's teachings, they're, they're too simple for us. Our minds are complicated. We're always looking for some complicated answers. But the, the, the correct answers are the very simple answers. Bhagavan has given us very, very, very simple answers. So we need to, we need to shed all our complex ideas and beliefs. And like a small child with a fresh mind, we need to come to Bhagavan and read his teachings with a fresh mind. And then we'll see all the answers are given there. In the meantime, somebody else can bring up their question. I'll just find her question. Yeah, I have a question. I'm Bama here. Okay. Right. Um, you know, we always believe that uh, by doing good karma, we are born in this state. Some people are suffering so much, some people are not suffering, some people are born in the palace, some people is born as a donkey. We all believe that it is due to the good karma we did in the last birth or something like that. We always believe that we should do good karma. But if we are in the state of you know, not caring about others and let it happen, you know, whatever happens, let it happen. You know, we, should, we are not the controlling people we know we are we are aware that we should not be controlling other people's lives if we don't care for others how do we do good karma um firstly it is not as simple as that yes whatever we experience is the fruit of our past karmas but why in this life are we experiencing these particular fruit that is according to the law of karma as taught by Bhagavan, in every life we are doing agamya. Agamya means the actions we do by our will. Those agamya bear, bear fruit. Those fruit get stored in sanchitta. The word sanchitta means a heap or pile. That is a vast heap or pile. Why? Because in each life, we are able to experience only a certain quantity of prarabdha, of destiny. But we have our desires are far greater than what we are able to experience. So we tend to create more fruit 
than we exhaust in each lifetime. That is the natural, uh, the normal way things go. It will be less so when our mind becomes more purified, but still we are producing, we, we're constantly producing fresh fruit. So the Sanchitta is a huge pile. It consists of good fruit and bad fruit. That is, even now, even if we're now a good person and generally doing good actions, avoiding bad actions as far as possible, Many, many lives ago, because we are all undergoing a spiritual evolution, as it were, spiritual growth. So many lives ago, we would have been all we'd have been rogues and ruffians and I mean, we would have yeah. been worse, sort of, worse sinners. So we may have done so many sins in the past. So sometimes we see in this lifetime, often, in fact, we see in the lives of great saints, mm -hmm. they suffer a lot. So yeah. if we say, oh, if they're suffering, so they must be bad people. Whereas all these um, people who are very rich, they must be good people. It doesn't work like that. For some reason, those rich people are given to experience some fruit of their karma. But what do they do with it? They create more bad karma. Yeah. I mean, see, a lot of the people who are rich and powerful in this world are doing worse type of things. So okay. just because someone experiences good fruit doesn't mean they're a good person. Just because someone experiences bad fruit doesn't mean they're a bad person. The fruit we are to experience in each life is selected by God. That's what Bhagavan says in the first verse of Upadesha Undiya. Um, mm -hmm. No, no, sorry. Um, Karmam payantaro kartana danaya. Karma giving fruit is by the uh, ordainment of God. That is, God decides which fruit should we should experience in this lifetime. And he selects those fruit that will be most conducive to our spiritual uh, welfare. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one point. The other point you ask, that is, if we are following a spiritual path, mm -hmm. our mind will be will be getting more and more pure. The more and more pure our mind becomes, the more we naturally care for others. When we see people suffering, we, 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 it pains us to see people suffering, and we do whatever we can to alleviate that suffering. But mm -hmm. in many cases, actually, however much we care, that is, this pandemic is causing so much suffering. We all care about it, but what can we do? There's very little we can do. We can take precautions. Yeah. to avoid getting infected ourselves, because if we avoid getting infected, we avoid passing on the infection to others. So we can take some precaution, but mm -hmm. beyond that, most of us can do very little. Um, and like that, there's so many injustices in this world. Like there are some people who have billions, hundreds of billions, there are some people who have, and there are people who have nothing. So mm -hmm. how would be, it's a world full of so much injustice, but can we solve these problems? No, we can't. So we, we, when we allow our mind to come outwards, naturally we, we, we care, we feel compassion, we feel pain by the injustices and the suffering caused to people and everything. But mm -hmm. what can we do about that? According to Bhagavan, the greatest help we can do to the world mm -hmm. is to turn within and thereby surrender ourselves to God. So uh, uh, by turning within, we're not being selfish. Mm -hmm. We're being the very opposite of selfish. Okay. Because selfishness arises from ego. When we turn our attention back within, ego is thereby dissolving back into its source. So mm -hmm. the most selfless thing we can do is mm -hmm. to practice self-investigation and self-surrender. That is, okay. the, this is the most self. So of all... Doing good karmas, nishkarmiya karma is very good, but among better than all nishkarmiya karmas, and eighty mood, and best of all, Bhagavan says, is just turning our attention within, ananya bhava, attending to nothing other than ourselves. That is better than all the very best karmas. Thank you. Michael, yes. I have Manas question. Can I just uh, ask yes, that question? Yes, yes, yes certainly. So she says uh, she would like to ask you about Swam Sadhu Natanananda. Yes. What do you remember about him? I know he was in India during the part of uh, Sadhu Natanananda's life, and I believe you saw him before his death. So she yes. wants to ask how, what do you remember about uh, Swami uh, Sadhu Natanananda? Okay. Um, yes, I, I used to go to him quite often. He and Sadhu Om were very close friends. So I often used to accompany Sadhu Om when he went to see him. Um, 
so in a sense, I knew him very well, but he he spoke almost no English, very, very little English. So I only heard him ever speaking in Tamil. And in those days, um, my uh, my knowledge of Tamil was very limited. I could sometimes follow a little bit of the conversations that were going on. And occasionally Nathan and Ander would say to Sadhuam, translate for him if it was something important. So sometimes I would hear things that uh, he had said. Otherwise I was often just trying my best to understand and not really understanding very well what they were talking about. Um, I, he, Nathan and Ander was a, um, he was a very, um, how to say, uh, it's a bit difficult to, to, to put it in words. Um, he was a very austere type. He didn't, for example, um, he didn't hold with festivals or he wasn't interested in any festival. Only very rarely at the time of um, Bhagavan's Aradhana, Bhagavan's Jayanti, Centenary Jayanti in 1980, the ashram managed to persuade him to come there for one or two events. I remember one event when, um, when they were releasing Sadhu Om's book, uh, Ramana Gitam, which had been just published by the ashram in, for the centenary. He came at that time and he, uh, he, he participated in some way, but very, very seldom would he, generally he would just stay, he lived in a cottage in Dorab's compound. That is by, I came to Tiruvannamalai in 1976. So by that time, he had already moved into a cottage in Dorab's compound. And very, very seldom I saw him leaving that compound. He was almost always remained there in his hut. And whenever he, there was anything he wanted to, um, he wanted to meet Sadom for any purpose, he would ask Dorab's gardener to come and uh, uh, carry. He often sent messages by uh, he'd write little notes and ask the gardener to bring it. And sometimes he would ask us to come there to discuss certain things. Um, uh, because Saduam also helped with, if he had any particular problems, like if there was some plumbing problem in his house or anything, Saduam would come there and would arrange for a plumber to come or things like that. So um, yes, I, I, knew, I knew him quite well, but um, it was mostly through Saduam because whenever I went, I went with Saduam. Very occasionally, um, I would go there. Uh, Saduam would send, would ask me to take a message to him, and I would sometimes go there. And then a little bit we'd talk, but because, um, as I say, my knowledge of Tamil was very limited. His knowledge of English was also very limited. There wasn't much we could say. But so generally, when I went to meet him, it was only with Saduam. Thank you. And he was, I say, he didn't like all these festivals. He was very strict. He was always said, only one thing you need to do. Bhagavan has taught one path and one path alone, the path of Vichara. Do Vichara, that's all that's necessary. He would always he'd be emphasizing that. And another thing I remember the first time I went to him, um, uh, he, he, he told me, um, that I went with Sadhuam and another friend, and he asked the other friend to translate. He told me, you are very, very fortunate. You, among all the, you've come to India, but among all the places of India, you've come here to, Bhag you've come here to Tiruvannamalai, to Bhagavan. There are so many gurus, Bhagavan, among all gurus, Bhagavan is, is the, Bhagavan is, uh, I, no other guru can be compared to Bhagavan. So you've come to the very best. And you're also fortunate you've come to Sadhuam because he will explain to you what Bhagavan, he will explain Bhagavan's teachings to you and he'll help you to understand Bhagavan correctly. But he said, there are so many foreigners who come here, they stay here for a while and then they wander away to other gurus. In those days, there was a lot of um, uh, Nisagadatta, that book I Am That had just recently been published and a lot of foreigners were, were talking a lot about this uh, book I Am That and it's just like Bhagavan teachings and everything. So people were talking about that. So somehow Nathan Ananda had heard about this. He said, there are all sorts of gurus. They, people will say they're like Bhagavan, but nobody is like Bhagavan. What Bhagavan has revealed has never been revealed so clearly by anyone before, and it will never be revealed by anyone so clearly after this. Bhagavan is the, Bhagavan is Dakshinamurti himself. 
come, Aaron actually himself, come in human form. So there's, don't, don't allow yourself, whatever people say about any other guru, don't allow yourself to be distracted. Cling to Bhagavan and Bhagavan alone. Bhagavan will save you. Follow Bhagavan's path and you, your, your salvation is assured. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Surya, you had a question. We have, maybe we can take one more question after that. Go ahead, Surya. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. This has been very insightful. And uh, I am new at practicing Atma Vichara or uh, self-inquiry. Uh, I'm wondering what is the solution that Bhagavan has proposed when a beginner realizes that who is this asking? Who is this person? What is What are they wanting? Um, I'm, I'm able to see when I practice it, mind is very fatigued by who is this, who is this, so it just stops the inquiry. What has happened is um, the thoughts have ceased, so it's really nice. However, if you're living in the day-to-day -day world, a bit of mindfulness needs to also be practiced because um, if you all went about practicing self-inquiry, we'd be sannyasis, I feel. Um, so maybe I'm just asking as a beginner, how do you try and balance both? Balancing those thoughts that you have to observe to keep equilibrium and keep sanity and to keep um, your ecosystem going. And how do you filter those thoughts that are not relevant and nourishing for um, the path to happiness or self-inquiry? That's, um, that's the question that I have. It's a very basic one. Okay. Um Firstly, when you say all thoughts um, cease, I think what you mean by all thoughts cease is the mental chatter ceases. Right. Thoughts don't cease. Mm. According to Bhagavan, the, um, everything, the whole, Bhagavan said the whole world is nothing but thoughts. Everything other than the pure awareness I am is a thought. Even ego, that which is aware of all other things, is itself a thought. It's the first thought I. So um, sometimes people say, I sat in meditation for 20 minutes and I was without thoughts. The I who says I sat in meditation <laughs> and the, is itself a thought, those 20 minutes of thought, it's all thought. Just because the mental chatter uh, is calmed down, that doesn't mean thought. Um, we, we are free of thoughts. Moreover, Bhagavan never asked us to concern ourselves about thoughts. As I read in this paragraph of, of the sixth paragraph of Nana, Bhagavan says, however many thoughts arise, so what? We don't have to be concerned about thoughts. Whenever any thought arises, if we, and he doesn't say if we ask, he says, if we investigate to whom it rises, it will be clear to me. And then we have to cling on to that self-attentiveness. So our concern should not be about thoughts. Let thoughts come or let them not come. As he says in, um, in the end of verse 6 of Aranacha Ashtakam, um, uh, after describing how the whole world is created from thoughts, like a cinema, he uses the cinema analogy there, and he ends up by saying, nindrida sendrida nine vida vindre, let them appear or let them not appear, they're not other than you. What is he conveying there? We don't have to worry about thoughts, we don't have to worry about the appearance of the world, all we need to worry about is clinging to, and he said they don't exist other than you, he's referring to Aranatra, and in the beginning of that verse, he said, uh, undur porol, uh, uh, um, sorry, <laughs> it slipped my mind. Um, yes, so I just want to get every word there correct because it's a very important. Um, uh, porol, there's one reality, one substance. Uh, what is that one substance? Uh, Ari voli, the light of awareness, uh, ulam, the heart, uh, you. So that alone is what exists. So you here means that light of awareness that is shining in our heart as I am. So what we need to be concerned about is only clinging to I am. Forget about thoughts, forget about the world. It need not concern them. So, so long as we're worrying, have thoughts stopped yet? 
how to stop thoughts. Our attention is going away from ourselves towards thoughts. Let the thoughts be there or not there. It's no concern of ours. In, in order to stop thoughts, we need to be totally indifferent to thoughts. If we, if we cling to I am, the thoughts will automatically subside. So all we need to be concerned about is clinging to I am. If we cling to I am, your other concern is about we, the thoughts which you think are necessary. According to Bhagavan, no thoughts are necessary at all. Because even for maintaining this body, no thoughts are necessary. Why? Because whatever that is our outward life, whatever is to happen to us, is already determined by Pararabdha. And whatever actions our mind, speech, or body need to do in order for us to experience that Pararabdha, they will be made to do. That is, Bhagavan says in the first sentence of his, the note he wrote for his mother, Avarabha Pararabdha Prakaram Adhikanavan Angan Girundu Atavipad. That means according to the uh, Prarabdha, according to the destiny of each person, he who is for that, he who is for that means God or Guru, Bhagavan in other words, uh, he who is for that being there, there, that means implies being in the heart of each one, Atavipan will make them dance. So our mind, speech and body will be made to do whatever actions are necessary in order for the, uh, for the destiny to be experienced. So we need, there is no thought that is necessary. The only thing that is necessary is that we cling to I. That is the ideal we should be aiming towards. However, because we have strong vishayavasana, strong inclination to go outwards, most of the time our mind is going outwards. While that, when our mind is going outwards, even then, even when we're not able to cling firmly to I am, <coughs> to self-attentiveness, <coughs> we need to be so, trying our best to surrender ourselves. That is, we shouldn't be, we, we should be keeping all our likes, dislikes, desires, attachments, and so on in check. We shouldn't be giving room to them to carry us away. <laughs> Bhagavan's path is not only the path of self-investigation, it's the path of self-surrender. Actually, self-investigation and self-surrender are inseparable, ultimately. They have one and the same path. But we cannot investigate ourselves without surrendering ourselves, and we cannot surrender ourselves without investigating ourselves. So we need, to, we need to view this path not only as a path of self-investigation, but also a path of surrender. What does surrender mean? There is a higher power. We'll call it Bhagavan. You can call it God or Guru or anything, but for, for, us, for, for us, that higher power is called Bhagavan. Bhagavan is taking care of everything. All that we, he knows all that we need better than we know it. So leave everything to him. We have to surrender all our will, all our likes, dislikes. Let your will alone be done. Not my will, your will alone. As he says in, uh, in verse six of our natural, uh, sorry, verse two of our natural patikam, ninishtam ninishtam, your will is my will. In other words, I have no will of my own. I want nothing but what you want. Whatever you want for me, that is what I want. Imbadaku, that is happiness for me. And he says in um, verse seven of our natural money malai, ennam eduvo adusevai, whatever be your thought, in other words, whatever be your will, do that. Kanne yundran karlinail kardal peruke taravaye. Only give me a surge of that ever, ever surging love, ever increasing love for your two feet. So we, our job is just to surrender ourselves to him by turning within and clinging to I am. So all we, all, that, that is, we, we should be one-pointed in our aim. Okay, our minds are still weak. Our mind may still be coming outwards, but we should understand that allowing our mind to go outwards is weakness. Holding on to I am, that is strength. Even when we allow our mind to come outwards, even then we should be reducing the strength of our inclination to go outwards. We should be, whatever happens, okay, let it happen. It's all Bhagavan's will. Let me not be concerned about anything. 
We, we truly, truly, Bhagavan has given us a very clear assurance. We don't have to be concerned about anything because he's taking care of everything. Oh, no, no, but don't I have to do my job? Don't I have to take care of my family? If you have to take care of them, Bhagavan will make you take care of them. Leave your, surrender your body, speech and mind mm. to him. Let him do with them as he wills. They're not any concern of yours. Thank you so much. Yeah, I got it. I think that was very helpful and very insightful. Um, so the point is cling on to the eye. Don't yes. concern yourself with thoughts. And yes. when you cling on to the eye, your will be done uh, is a very easy process to submit to. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Okay. But the, the correct way to surrender our will to his will is to, what does he want? He wants us to so, uh, subside back into our source and be happy. So by clinging to I am, we are truly surrendering our will to his will. Thank you. That was very nice. Thank you. <laughs> Helpful. That is, we are aligning our will. What he wants for us, that is what all we want. He wants us to subside and to be happy. Absolutely, Michael. Yeah. We would love to have you back. We would love to hear more mm -hmm. about Bhagwan and Nanyar and all the mm -hmm. teachings. So thank you for that. There's, and in a sense, there's very little to say because Bhagavan's teachings are extremely simple. So if you ask me to come back again, you'll find that I may be saying it in different ways, but I'll be saying the same thing again, 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 because Bhagavan's message is extremely simple. Yes. But yes. To, for us to fully imbibe it takes years of practice and uh, our practice is supported by constantly reading his teachings, thinking about his teachings and putting them into practice. That is what, uh, that should be, uh, take up our whole life. <laughs>